The next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 9329 in the name of Richard Lyle on celebrating 125 years of the Showman's Guild. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I'd invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Mr Lyle, if you're ready, would you like to open the debate? Seven minutes, please, or thereby. Thank you, President Officer. Firstly, I'd like to thank all members who have supported this debate today. I'd also like to thank all the members of the Showman's Guild who are in the gallery today at the, at the very back. In particular, Mr Alec James Calhoun, Chairman of the Showman's Guild, Scottish Showman's Guild, Mr David Wallace, President of the Showman's Guild of Great Britain, Philip Paris, Junior Vice President, Councillor John Cullion, MBE, Senior Vice President. They have all worked tirelessly for years to advance the position of the Showman's Guild within today's society. I am pleased to say that this motion received cross-party support within one day, which shows the high degree and high regard that the Showman's Guild is held by the members of this Parliament in particular. Showman's Guild of Great Britain is a trade association of travelling showmen who gain their livelihoods by attending fun fairs, and this year marks their 125th anniversary. They are by far the oldest and largest organisation representing their industry and community. Historically, the Guild was largely created due to the evangelical efforts of George Smith of Colville, a preacher from Leicestershire. He was a self-appointed guardian of public morals and first sought to have his movable dwellings bill accepted by the House of Commons in 1889. By this point, George Smith had already been successful in persuading MPs to pass legislation restricting the lives of those who operated and lived in canal boats, and he sought to have similar measures imposed upon caravan dwellers. The bill implied that those who lived in movable dwellings were of a immoral nature, lived in unsanitary conditions, and the children of van dwellers did not receive any education. Totally untrue. These accusations were not only an insult to the travelling showman's community, but also a serious threat to their way of life. Once the showman realised that George Smith's proposed measures would have severe effects on their lives, the leading travelling showman of the day met to, how, met to discuss how they might oppose the bill. The meeting resulted in collaboration and they decided to join together as the United Kingdom Van Dwellers Association. It was then under this banner that they enlisted the support of members of parliament and other civic, uh, civil society and civic liberty groups. The campaign la lasted four years and finally resulted in a victory when George Smith's bill was rejected by the UK parliament. The showman decided that the Van Dwellers Association should continue and be kept in place to advocate and represent their interests in the future. Their initial successes in the association instilled confidence and led to a series of voluntary regional committees to be established in order to maintain contact with members. By 1911, the name of the Van Dwellers Association had now changed to the recognised Showman's Guild. This change came as a result of appointing Reverend Thomas Horn as the first full General Secretary. Under Reverend Thomas Horn, the Guild transformed to a well-organised and influential national body. By the end of Reverend Thomas Horn's life, the Showman's Guild had reassembled much of its current shape. Regional committees existed on a firmer footing and became the ten sections through which the Guild is administered today. Members were also required to observe a strict set of rules with strong uh, ethical grounding, which Reverend Thomas Horn had originally called for. Throughout the Guild's 125-year existence, their role has remained unchanged. The Showman's Guild serves the purpose to promote, protect and protect the interests of its members, the travelling showmen who provide and uphold the nation's fun fairs. It is with this purpose the Showman's Guild has remained strong. However, the members of the Showman's Guild are not only characterised by their choice of work. These men and women who are contributing citizens to the nation, many of, of whom were and are veterans during the First and Second World War, more than 3,000 showmen volunteered to fight on behalf of Great Britain. Of these brave men and women, almost 25 per cent of them were killed in the line of duty. Show people at home raised money to pay for a fleet of 19 ambulances, and the Showman's Guild started the, the Spitfire Fund, which raised £5,000 to pay for a Spitfire called the Fund of the Fair. Today the Guild has a memorial within the National Memorial Arboretum, remembering the fallen showmen who died in service to the country. 
Their dedication to their country extends beyond their ability to provide safe, enjoyable experiences for their children and their families. They have a rich history of standing up to protect the civil liberties and freedom of their fellow countrymen, and I believe this deserves our respect. I also believe that the Showman's Guild deserves our respect for their dedication to ensuring that all fun fairs are run with the highest standard of safety. The Showman Guild plays a high, places a, high value, a very high value on the maintenance of all, all rides as well as proper safety precautions and protocols. It has played a large role in the drafting of the Code of Safety Practice at Fairs. This manual is the most comprehensive safety manual for the industry ever produced. And since its introduction, the Guild has expanded the manual to include specific regulations for individual types of unfair rides. All members owning rides must submit their equipment each year for thorough examination, with annual inspections conducted by the independent engineers to avoid conflict of interest. The scope of inspections are wide and without adherence to high standards. The rides are banned. With such a high, rich history, and many contributions to our society. I am very pleased today to have this debate. I am very pleased to have members of the Showman's Guild in the public chamber. And I am very pleased to celebrate the 125th anniversary of the Showman's Guild. The Guild and this Parliament have now, I believe, a strong relationship, which I hope, through ministers, will continue to thrive and grow through time. I hope that throughout this debate today, we will all come to learn a bit more about the Showman's Guild, their way of life and the challenges that they face, the everyday economic challenges that they face. Finally, President Officer, I am very pleased for this opportunity to speak in this debate today. I look forward to other members' contributions uh, and I, I thank you very much for uh, this debate. Thank you. And thank you. I now call on Mary Fee to be followed by David Torrance. Four minutes are thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking Richard Lyle for securing this member's debate today and for his work on behalf of the Showman's Guild? And can I also welcome members of the Showman's Guild who join us in the gallery today? Reaching the anniversary of 125 years for the Guild is a remarkable achievement for all involved, both past and present. And as Deputy Convener for the Cross Party Group, we have heard much about the rich history of showmen in Scotland and the challenges they face across our communities. Showmen and women have contributed to Scotland's society, both culturally and economically, for many years. And as the First Minister said in 2009, when referring to the Guild, their members and their families, show people are an important part of Scotland's culture, history and economy and combine a strong tradition of family and community with a high level of entrepreneurship and business acumen. Yes, yeah. Maureen Watt, have you got your card in, please? Thank you very much for giving um, way. When she said she made, they made a valuable contribution to the economy, on this day where the uh, Royal Highland Show uh, begins, does she agree with me that they pay a very valuable contribution to agricultural shows throughout Scotland and they encourage young people to get involved in agricultural shows because they provide a great attraction for our youth? Mary Fee. Can I thank Maureen Watt um, for her comments and I absolutely 100% concur with the comments um, that she has made. But clearly, the, the Showman's um, Guild they are a, a distinct and unique group whose culture and tradition we should both protect and be proud of. Yet we often hear within the cross-party group of the many barriers restricting the growth and vibrant opportunities available for show people. And one of these barriers is the current public entertainment licensing regime, which stems from the Civic Government Scotland Act of 1982. The 32 local authorities have what has been called a scattergun approach to the fees and interpretation of the Act. Some councils charge for temporary licences, some for a full year, some charge per ride, some charge per size, by size, and many of these conditions are unnecessary and disproportionate. My own local authority, Renfrewshire, charges £812, which is the highest across Scotland. Clickmanninshire, for example, is only £61. And I have written to Renfrewshire to ask them to explain why the costs are so high. 
and the expensive charge may be why we have lost two annual fares in Linwood and at Paisley St James. And I know from my experience in local government that fares are wrongly viewed by some as problematic and noisy, but we have to work to ensure the traditions of showmen are maintained and relationships between them and local authorities are improved. We cannot afford to lose the rich tradition of showmen and the benefits they bring to local communities. We should support and celebrate their culture, not marginalise and stigmatise it. And we need collaboration between the Guild and Scottish ministers to reduce the burdensome red tape. The motion praises the Scottish Showmen's Guild's continued success in regulating Scotland's fairgrounds. And research has shown that in order to gain authority from the Health and Safety Executive, Showgrounds must comply with 20 pieces of legislation from the Health and Safety Act 1974 to the Equalities Act 2010. And the Guild has been at the forefront of safety and best practice and has been instrumental in working with the Health and Safety Executive in promoting the highest standards of public safety. And, Presiding Officer, I briefly highlighted the history of the showman in my opening remarks and I'd like to go back and finish with this. And for centuries, show people have brought a range of entertainment services to communities across Scotland, such as those I mentioned in Renfrewshire and to the Kirkcaldy Lynx Market, which is Europe's longest street fair. And as a child, I was fortunate to spend every summer in St Andrews. My father was an avid golfer. And the highlight of my summer break was the Lammas Market. The Lammas Market has its roots in medieval history and is one of Europe's oldest markets. And I still remember running from our house in North Street up to Market Street to the fair. And for my colleagues in, in the chamber, my favourite ride was the carousel. I wasn't a Dodgems girl or a Waltzers girl. My ride was the carousel. And I still cannot pass a fair without standing watching the carousel. And now that we are well into our Scottish summer, we know the benefits that gala days bring to our communities. And, and you're into your sixth minute. I'll, just, I'll be very, very quick. Briefly. What we need is a regulatory system that enables showmen and their families to harness that and to flourish across Scotland and enable their unique history, tradition and culture to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now call on David Torrance to be followed by Alex Johnson. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to congratulate Richard Lyle on securing today's debate celebrating the 125th anniversary of the Showmen's Guild of Scotland. I welcome Chairman, Vice-Chair, members of the Showman Guild and distinguished guests to a public gallery today. On such a historic occasion as the anniversary of celebrating an impressive 125 years, it seems proper to note the relationship that Kirkcaldy in particular has had with the Showman. Lynx Market, which takes place on Kirkcaldy Esplanade every year, has a history that stretches back to 1305 and has entertained residents of the Langtoon and surrounding areas for centuries. Lynx Market can boast of being the longest street fair in Europe, and the length of time that Kirkcaldy has benefited from the showman's involvement in our community shows that they are an integral part of the people in our town and should be celebrated accordingly. Although this year marks the 125th year of the Showman's Guild, showmen have been entertaining at the Lynx Market for more than 700 years. The century-old tie to our community has become an important part of the town's heritage, and it gives me great confidence that the work of the Showman's Guild will continue to bring the Lynx Market to Kirkcaldy for years to come. It also undoubtedly continues to raise a profile of the Langtoon every year on a national level. My love for the Lynx Market, I must confess, is more of an obsession. As someone who grew up only a street away from a site, I know from my experience how its arrival every year was hotly anticipated by many of the locals. The smell and sound was like a magnet, not only to me, but to young children and teenagers from all around. So sixpence a day for school dinners and fratons from a tuck shop were saved up and carefully hidden away weeks in advance. Such was my determination to be able to enjoy all the wonderful thrown rides and stalls beckoning to me, especially the one with the toppy apples. Sandwiches were made up the night before, so at least I had something to eat at school. When I wasn't allowed to go to the market, the excuse was always, I'm away out to play football, Mum. Mum would say, OK, but you better not be going down Lynx Market, you're too young. No, I'm going to play football, Mum. Not going near it was always my response. You better not, or you're in big trouble. So with my mum's warning ringing in my ears, off I went to a market oblivious of what the consequences would, consequences would be later on. The old speedway, octopus, metro, what a great night with your friends. Then back up the road in time so you're safe, or so I thought. Mum, you've been down the Lynx Market. 
No, we play football, Mum. You've been down the Lynx Market. Unbeknown to me, the top of an apple I couldn't resist on the way home had left its mark all over my face, <laughs> so it was off to bed with Mum's wrath at my heels. <laughs> Presiding officer, on a more serious note, showmen of Scotland have been facing some difficult times over the past years. And to their credit, members of Guild have been working extremely hard trying to resolve many of the problems encountered by their members. Along with the help of a cross-party work group, which has both been active in Parliament and with local authority areas covering a wide range of issues. It appears to be with the 32 local authorities in Scotland that showmen encounter most of their problems, from a loss of sites to obstructions put in their way, planning applications for fun fairs. Issues like these have impacted severely on showmen's ability to entertain and trade. All 32 local authorities seem to have their own rules and regulations on how to manage showmen and affairs, but most contentious without doubt, is licensing and the conditions local authorities attach to it. In Fife, the Council charged a reasonable £100 for a licence for the Lynx Market, the longest street fair in Europe, which surely is an example of good practice. In other local authorities across Scotland, however, licence costs range from a few hundred pounds to thousands, and all for a simple piece of paper to allow them to entertain. This and other issues with a public entertainment licence cause no end of problems to showmen. This is something that does not exist south of the border, with showmen travelling from across the UK or on a level playing field. An attempt to alleviate the problems facing by showmen with regard to licence, I would urge the Scottish Government to look at the Civic, Go Civic Government Scotland Act 1982 and ask them to consider amending it to view the exemption for travelling to fun fairs. Presiding officer, due to its strong connections with Kirkcaldy, I have asked Fife Council if it will host a civic reception to honour the Showmen's Guild, long standing commitment to our town. I hope that we will be able to join our council and local community in celebrating this momentous year with its members of an organisation that has historically maintained such a close ties to Kirkcaldy. Once again, I would like to congratulate the Showman's Guild of Scotland on reaching its 125th anniversary. I am certain that it will continue to represent the best interests of showmen across Scotland for years to come, and I particularly look forward to seeing its relationship with Kirkcaldy flourish. I would like to take this opportunity to wish the Showman's Guild all the very best for the future. Many thanks. I now call on Alex Johnson to be followed by John Mason. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to thank Richard Lyle for bringing this motion to Parliament and proposing it today. And I'd also like to take the opportunity on behalf of the Conservative Group in the Scottish Parliament to congratulate the Showman's Guild on its 125 years of history. It is, in fact, the case that I've had a history lesson today. Richard Lyle's opening speech told me a great deal more about the Showman's Guild and the history and tradition that lie behind it than I ever knew before. And, if nothing else, then this debate has served to educate me and perhaps one or two others. The fact is that a visit to the fun fair was always one of the most exciting prospects uh, as a child. I remember being taken along and I have to say that my perception was that it was something slightly risky, slightly dangerous. I think David Torrance's mother would have agreed me, with me on that. <laughs> However, the interesting aspect of it was that it was, uh, although it gave that perception, it never was risky and it never was dangerous. And that's why it attracted young people in the way it did. Uh, I think we make the mistake too often these days of wrapping our young people in cotton wool. Uh, and too many of them spend their time playing video games when perhaps they should be out there uh, at the fair. I know for a fact that taking my own children along was always an exciting experience and now I also have the opportunity to take my grandchildren and I will continue to do so. That great safety record uh, is not only in the environment around uh, fears, but it's also the issue of equipment. As we heard from Richard Lyle, uh, there were perhaps uh, issues in the distant past with safety, but the Showman's Guild and the people who are involved in it have made wonderful strides forward, and it is now the case that we hear very rarely of accidents uh, on fairgrounds, and that is an indication that the standards of safety which are being employed are of the highest possible level. I also, however, think that there's something else going on here that we need to commemorate, and it falls under the heading of culture. The family tradition that exists within the showman is something that I think we should pay tribute to today. 
There are in this modern world few industries where businesses pass down through the family and we, these traditions are maintained uh, on a cultural level as well as a business level. And I think we should pay tribute to all those within the Showman's Guild who have fostered that development of a, a business model rooted to the family. I think that's worthy of praise. We have, of course, heard one or two really interesting facts during the course today. today. The idea of Mary Fee uh, still willing to get on a wooden horse is one that I quite look forward to. The, however, Mary raised a far more significant issue and one that was raised by David Torrance also, and that is the issue of regulation by local authority. Now, this is not the first time today I've raised uh, with this minister the subject of what Mary Fee described as the scattergun approach of local authorities. Uh, I think it is vital if we are to encourage the tradition of the travelling fairground that we have some kind of consistency around the country. And I am aware that certain local authorities, including my own on occasion in the past, have been uh, or have acquired a reputation for being difficult when it comes to that licensing and regulation process. I think we should look for a way to simplify that, to maximise safety, to standardise regulation so that fares can travel around the country and do so without wads of red tape uh, wrapping up the, the entire process. Finally, uh, as I come to a close, I, I was also interested in one other fact that was raised by David Torrance, and that was that it was at a fairground he was able to buy that toffee apple that gave him away when he got home to his mother. Well, in this day of health and safety and all that sort of thing, let's say that even a toffee apple would count as one of his five a day. And then we'll... Uh, Mr Mason, now to be followed by Siobhan McMahon. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And first, uh, can I also thank uh, Richard Lyle for lodging this motion, initiating uh, this debate today. And I think thanks to him also for the time and effort that he has put into this uh, whole topic, uh, not least in heading up the cross-party group. Uh, relationships have been mentioned already, and relationships are very important. And I think Richard Lyle has certainly invested a lot of time in building up these relationships. Uh, we also want to congratulate the Guild on reaching their 125th anniversary and wish them uh, many more years of fruitful work. Uh, when I was a youngster, I used to go to the shows in Rutherglen uh, in Overton Park, which, if I remember correctly, was a blaze football pitch the rest of the time. However, that area is now occupied by a care home, uh, which obviously is a good thing in itself, uh, but that means the shows no longer operate on that site. I suspect many of us have memories of going uh, on the rides, shooting at goldfish, I, I mean, sorry, shooting uh, to, to win uh, goldfish, uh, and all, all the buzz and colour that was uh, really exciting uh, for youngsters, and I know still is uh, for many. Uh, I'm also happy uh, that so many show people have chosen to live uh, in my own constituency in the East End of Glasgow. However, these days there does seem uh, a certain amount of inconsistency throughout Scotland as to how shows and show people are treated. Now, I'm certainly in agreement that local authorities should have the right to make their own decisions for their own area. However, there is a particular problem with a group like the Showman's Guild, which is operating throughout Scotland and being treated very differently in different places. The first major problem is whether they're actually allowed to operate at all. Uh, we had a proposed fair in Easter House, which lies just outside my constituency, where verbal assurance had been given that all would be OK, and people and equipment were already moving and incurring costs in moving to the site. But then there was an objection lodged by the police listing all of the past crime in that area, despite the fact most of that crime had absolutely nothing to do with any fair whatsoever. But it was used as a reason for turning down the application. The next problem, which has already been mentioned, is the widely divergent level of fees that may be charged by a local authority. For example, I understand Glasgow charges £597 in comparison to Clackmannanshire's 61 now, we can look at the individual decisions, for example, a council decision to refuse a licence, and discuss why each particular decision was made. However, I think there's also a need for us to look at the bigger national picture and consider whether there is actually some discrimination going on here against a whole group of people going on. We are considering a group of people who are very much part of the tradition and culture of this country, as has already been eloquently said by others, and perhaps their way of life is not well understood by the majority population. 
And I think there can also be confusion uh, between who are show people, who are gypsy travellers uh, and other groups. Are we looking for a local or a national solution here? Now, I do accept that it's not just a national issue, but I certainly do think it is a national issue, as well as obviously having local dimensions. If we are serious about helping and protecting all minorities in modern Scotland, then surely show people are one of these minority groups, and they are a group who very much need uh, or deserve our active intervention and support. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Siobhan McMahon to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Thank you. I congratulate Richard Lyle for securing this afternoon's debate and I thank him for making sure that the tremendous achievements of the Sh Scottish Women's Guild is recognised in Parliament in this fitting way. To my shame, I knew very little, if anything, of the Showman's Guild before entering Parliament, but I'm pleased to say that in the last three years I've learned a great deal about this fantastic organisation and the work that they do in our communities throughout Scotland. That's not to say that I was completely ignorant of their work before that period, but I wouldn't have recognised that work as being anything formal or indeed wouldn't have been aware of how substantial that work that the showmen do throughout Scotland has on our economy. I grew up in Lanarkshire and enjoyed many of the fairs that have been established over the years by members of this guild. There is only one fair in particular that has memories for me. It was held near my grandparents' home in York Hill, and when the shows arrived, my brother, sister and I knew that the start of summer had arrived too. We are one of many families that had a uh, great experience in that and those types of memories, and it's all down to the hard work and determination of the showmen to continue to entertain our local communities for such a sustained period of time. Other members have already mentioned the fairs in their own communities, or indeed the memories they have when visiting fairs in other parts of Scotland. My colleague Claire Baker, who cannot be with us this afternoon due to other commitments, asked me to pass on her apologies to the Chamber and the Showmen's Guild in particular. However, she also wanted me to convey her thanks to those who made her feel so welcome at the Kirkcaldy Lynx Market. Claire has spoken to me many times before about this fair, as it's the one she brings her daughter to each year. Hopefully one year she will extend that invite to me too. <laughs> members have spoken of some of the challenges faced by the showmen at this time and the importance of the Guild in helping their members face them. It's simply not good enough that financial barriers are put in place by local authorities and the police. As the Chairman of the Guild said recently in a newspaper article, there is more red tape and it is more expensive to run shows in Scotland than any other country in Europe. It's become more and more difficult to get a licence each year. It is time that that was met with a challenge from the government, and I would encourage the Minister to respond to that. The other issue I would invite the government to respond to is a matter of registering showmen's families at schools. Under the present arrangements, there is no place for the families to indicate that their children are from a showman's background, and therefore their culture is not only not recorded, but not recognised. The closest category the children can fall under is gypsy traveller, which is clearly not the, the ethnic grouping or cultural grouping. If this was to happen to any other group of people, we would be reading the newspaper headlines day after day. However, this matter doesn't seem to be getting so much as an acknowledgement, never mind resolution. I hope that after today that will change. As previously mentioned, I have gained a lot more knowledge about the Showman's Guild in the last few years. I now know about the Scottish section of the UK Guild, the history of their establishment, who hosts the longest street fair in Europe, how many education liaison officers the Scottish section have, and the fact that the showmen have their own international football tournament. My knowledge is entirely down to the hard work and determination of the Guild's chairman, Alec James Calhoun, and his staff, in particular James Rogers. I would like to thank them for taking the time to speak with me and keeping me updated in developments, not just in central Scotland, but throughout Scotland. I appreciate that greatly. I look forward to others gaining knowledge of this fantastic guild when the feature film by Martin Smith is completed and shown in Scotland and beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much. I now call on Stuart Stevenson, after which we move to the Minister for the closing speech. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And let me join with others in congratulating uh, Richard uh, Lyle and in gaining time for this uh, debate, of course, focusing as it does on the 125th anniversary of the Guild, a truly impressive ap achievement indeed. And I'm sure I speak for uh, many who've enjoyed uh, the work that the Guild does, the entertainment that we see in the streets and uh, sometimes country locations uh, across Scotland. My parents used to let me go. I must have been a particularly responsible child that they, they did that. <laughs> It, it, it is, it's, an, it's an argument I see gains little support in the chamber today. Uh, 
But I think uh, we need to put this in the context of the modern world. We can go to the cinema, watch ours on telly, play in our phones and iPads. But the value and the entertainment that's derived from genuine, live, spontaneous entertainment and the unique carnival atmosphere we get uh, when the showmen uh, come to town is very much different and still attracts uh, in the modern world. And I think it's right that we are here today to express our gratitude for that spontaneity and genuine grounded entertainment that's uh, provided. Seneca, the uh, Roman philosopher, once said, as the soil, however rich it be, cannot be productive without cultivation, so the mind without good culture can never produce good fruit. And the Showman's Guild are an essential and integral part of our culture. They travel around Scotland, showing us things that we might otherwise not be familiar with. They are grounded in Scotland's past and yet adapting to meet the needs of Scotland's future. The entertainment is family friendly, it's unique, and I hope it never uh, goes unnoticed. Uh, Maureen Watt uh, talked about local shows and I. Uh, woke up on Tuesday morning, I have my wee house when I'm down here in Linlithgow, to the sounds of the showies in the car park at Tesco in Linlithgow. It's the annual Marches Day celebrations of beating the boundaries of Linlithgow, and the showman coming to town is an essential part of that. And in my area of the country, the area I represent, we're looking forward uh, the first weekend in August uh, to the Tara Show, the second biggest agricultural show in Scotland after the Highland Show that's here this week. And you can't get into the Highland Show without having to walk through the showground, the noise, the hubbub, the people with uh, toffee apples, yes, and uh, sugar, sugar on sticks and just the sheer excitement of it all, two days that attracts tens of thousands of people uh, to there, and the show is an integral and important part of that. The show itself, of course, uh, complements what the showmen bring, has horses, dancing, wide spectrum of competitions, and the industrial market key that they're adjacent to has over 1,700 craft-based uh, displays and the show as a whole, 250 trade stands. So the showmen add luster and excitement to that very important event to which people come from all over the world. There are thousands of people depend on the entertainment of the showmen's uh, guild. The events aid tourism by dragging people in. They're an important part uh, of our economy. I hope that we never forget the contribution that's made, but also recognise the challenges that we sometimes create. Um, let me just suggest, for example, one from my personal experience. In 1971, we had decimalisation. The penny and the roll, the penny stall that I was particularly addicted to, became a totty wee coin, and the new two pence coin was, of course, five times as valuable. And that was a significant challenge. And nobody, when they were doing decimalisation, uh, thought about that. I uh, owe gratitude for my remarks to my American intern. She's been absolutely amazed to discover about the Showman's Guild and all that they do as the research to help me in my contribution today. So we're truly reaching out to international engagement. Presiding officer. Many thanks. Uh, now move to the closing speech from Minister Derek Mackay. Seven minutes or thereby, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Government's response, my response, will come in three parts as a consequence of the debate. The first point around regulation and the matters raised in the course of the debate. The second is celebration. And third, the more personal element, since other members uh, have indulged us with their personal experience. I've thoroughly enjoyed the contributions of Richard Lyle, Mary Fee, the intervention from Maureen Watt, David Torrance, Alec Johnston, John Mason, Siobhan McMahon and Stuart Stevenson. I don't think I've left anybody out in the contributions uh, to this afternoon's uh, debate. E e even, Mr. even Mr Johnson is not paying attention at the moment to my very wise remarks. On the subject of uh, regulation, we have discussed uh, earlier regulation in terms of uh, uh, waste. I think very valid points have been put 
uh, in the chamber today about the complexity of the 32 different local authorities applying 32 different variations of both licensing uh, and the fee, fee structures. But I'm sure members would welcome that there is actually work in hand to look at greater consistency around fees to try and harmonise it across uh, the country. And that works uh, going on with, with the working group, of course. The, the Minister would um, agree with me that the, one of the key themes across um, the debate today has, about, has been about inconsistency. And I wonder if we share my disappointment in the inconsistent approach of South Lanarkshire Council, who after many years of having the shows in Lark Hall look now to block it uh, and just obviously um, express that that disappointment um, for the young people in Lark Hall, because one of the things that they do do is they have a day when all the schools come together, irrespective of what religious background they've got, and they have a day like that. And just for the Minister's information, I'm a Walsall's girl, the faster the better. <laughs> well, Mister. I'm not sure I want to make any comment on that contribution and either identifying any particular council or additional personal information, but I would say that <laughs> Through the Better uh, Regulation uh, Act, the regulatory reform work, we do hope to get greater consistency on matters that sometimes are best determined locally, but where there can be national consistency, we want to deliver that. Uh, I commit to working a partnership approach with local government to try and deliver that. I understand there was a very successful meeting with Cabinet Secretary Kenny McCaskill earlier today, and we'll take forward that consensual approach. And I hope that the same cross-party attitude that we've enjoyed today in the Chamber will be replicated in local government when I have these discussions. And I hope I don't have the experience where Parliament says one thing and the same parties and local government take a different view, because there is a point around what Mr Mason is saying about you know, nimbyism in terms of my planning remit as well. Sometimes we like folk to enjoy themselves, but just not anywhere near me is not the kind of attitude that we would want to encourage. I'm also very mindful with licensing requirements. There is no requirement for local authorities to license funfairs at all. It is absolutely at their discretion as to how they do it. So we'll work on that uh, regulatory agenda. In terms of the uh, uh, personal reflections that we've heard from, and Mary Fees, I was particularly interested in, because Mary will know my area well. I was raised in Ard Road in Catlinuk and Renfrew, and behind that housing street, there's a, a playing field. And the playing field had the pleasure of the showmen come to put on the shows in one particular week. And I took very great interest in this, so I went unaccompanied without an adult. Alec Johnston makes the point about uh, sometimes wrapping our children up in cotton. Well, the problem was I was five at the time uh, that I went. The family had wondered where I had gone. Such was the attraction uh, to the shows and the, uh, what, was, what was being put on. A family was looking for me, and there I was, enjoying myself with uh, the shows, of course, who were looking, at me, looking uh, after me very well. That could have been a misdirection in profession for me. I found a happy home in politics, but you never know. I could have ended up in the, in the Showman's Guild. So to the celebration, I commend uh, and congratulate Richard Lyle in securing this debate and recognition of the Scottish Showman's Guild, the 125th uh, anniversary. A real celebration of many things good about our society and how they've enriched it's Scottish society as well, contributing and evolving and, and changing and, and, and delivering fantastic events across the nation from village galas to, to festivals, enriching our culture and our history. And, and I did have a place for the future as well as, as well as the economic and entrepreneurial and business acumen that the, the First Minister indeed has referenced. I'm also very mindful that the First Minister, Alex Salmond, had the honour of being an honorary member uh, of, of the Guild. Uh, which was uh, news to me as well, and of course that's uh, very welcome. I'm also aware that the Scottish section of the Showman's Guild of Great Britain is the largest section showing the strength that they have in Scotland, with nearly 400 members building on that strong tradition of, of entertainment and contribution uh, to local communities. So I would encourage the Guild to continue its work of protecting the cultural heritage of uh, show people, which does help bring communities together. And close to my own constituency is the Govan Old Parish uh, Church. And I don't know how many people know that that's actually the recognised church for all show families in Scotland and can be evidenced as manifested as well through some of the artwork in the church windows, where you'll be able to see the show logo of a hobby horse, uh, which uh, is celebrated in that particular uh, church. So we'll look at regulation uh, and support, recognising the place that the the Guild uh, plays and that fairs and, and shows uh, do uh, for Scotland as well. And I think uh, the, the, the history is, is very well uh, established. And I enjoyed listening about the Kirkcaldy links uh, as well. First established by Edward I in 1318, uh, 
05 in terms of granting the borough of Kirkcaldy the right to hold an annual fair at Easter Octave. And this has become uh, grown to become the Lynx Market that uh, we've heard about. So great celebration, great contribution to our communities, to our tradition, uh, to our culture and our society, and all the reasons to be positive in, in delivering. And I think it does contribute to the government's overarching objective of sustainable economic growth. And there are further uh, opportunities ahead in 2014 and, of course, beyond with the year of homecoming events right across uh, Scotland, to which uh, showmen and women will, of course, uh, contribute to and make it very special as we market Scotland and raise the potential uh, that exists, as well as a celebration of the year of food and drink in 2015 as well, and would encourage the Guild to work with us to, to capitalise on that again. So I'm delighted to be able to have been, been able to contribute to the uh, debate, support uh, the motion across party way that it's been uh, supported uh, as well, and wish the Scottish Showman's Guild every success as it heads towards the next 125 years, and future generations can experience all the fun of the fair. Very much. And I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.15. Note the change of time. 2.15.